Chapter 3 God Who is God? God is that who has transcended all that is seen by us. If transcending this world, is there no relation between that and this world? Not a particle here is unrelated to God. Then what is meant by transcending the world? The world comprises us and the objects seen by us. In other words, the animate and inanimate together form the world. What shall we say of that? who created the beings and things. Of these two, we say the conscious beings to be superior. All that we can apprehend is that that belongs to the highest order of beings known to us. Our intellect cannot proceed further. Thus, our Creator is superior to us. That cannot be apprehended by our intellect. Therefore, the name transcended being, Kadawu, means that that surpasses our intellect. Hence the name is Kadawu, transcended being. Can God then not be made known to us? Not quite so. In a way, God is known to us. This much of God's grace is enough for us. We have no need for all God's greatness. God has made so much of the greatness as will suffice to eradicate our misery. There is no reason for God to reveal a jot more of their power than is necessary to remedy our defects in the present state. Thus God is known according to our needs. God is in our grasp. However limitless God is within reach of our knowledge to some extent.
What is it which brings God within reach of our knowledge? That God is known as being, consciousness, bliss. Being denotes that which is imperishable, that which exists forever. Should God become non-existent at any time, who is their destroyer? Who created God? Since the perishable nature of all leads to the inference that they are lorded over by one who is imperishable, this immortal overlord is God. Their imperishable nature is being sat. Now, what is consciousness, chit? By consciousness we mean knowledge. This is absolute knowledge, and not like our erring intellectual knowledge. Irregularity or mistake cannot stay in its actions. It is knowledge, pure and simple. Frequently God teaches us saying, your knowledge is irregular and erring How orderly are even the insentient objects of God's creation? It is known to many how an atheist was taught a good lesson when he derided the scheme of things, saying, Why did God make the seed so small for the banyan tree, which is so big? That an insentient thing is found in good order and later becomes useful implies a conscious agency at work. Can a simple insentient thing do something which is possible for unfailing knowledge only? Or can't it be done by our inadequate knowledge? No, it can never be. Therefore God is said to be consciousness, chit, also.
Now, what is bliss? It is a state of being free from desire for anything. It is peace which is ever full. Were one to desire anything, how could that be better than oneself? How could we gain bliss from that? One themselves would require another being to fulfill their desires. The state of self-contentment is that of bliss also. Therefore, that is called bliss, ananda. The three being consciousness and bliss are inseparable. Otherwise, they would become naught individually. Hence, that is known as being consciousness bliss, Sat Chit Ananda. Thus God remains not only transcendent, but also falls within the reach of our knowledge as being consciousness bliss. One who has gained the fourth state and sees all as one. Only they know God truly as being consciousness bliss. Words cannot express, nor the ears hear, how such a one is united with God. It is a matter of realization. But there are ways and means for such realization. They can be spoken of, learned and acted upon.
that which can be realized thus is God. It has no name. We give it a name. It has no form. We give it a form. Where is the harm in doing so? What name is not that? Or what form is not that? Where is the sound or form in which that is not? Therefore, in the absence of true knowledge of that, you can name it as you please, or imagine it as of any form, so to remember it. Your hope for God's grace without any effort on your part is utterly fruitless. Should it be possible to have God's grace without any effort on your side, all would be alike. There would be no reason for any difference. God has shown us the ways and means Make effort, reach the goal, be happy. Your idleness and selfishness make you expect God's grace without your effort. The rule for all is for you too. Do not relax your efforts. God can be realized by your effort only. There is an effort which excels all others. This may, however, appear to be less effective than devotion to God with name and form. Nevertheless, this is the more efficient. It is simply the love which you extend to all beings, whether good or bad. In the absence of such love to all, your devotion to God amounts to a mere parody. Of what use are you to God? that you seek fulfillment of your desires from God 
without doing your duty towards the needy in the world must be attributed to your selfishness. In God's presence, there is no use for such. The workings that take place in God's presence are all unselfish. Therefore, think that all the centres are that, and that is in all the centres, and thus be devoted to God. God is truly bound by such high devotion. As you go on ascribing names and forms to God and showing love to all, because you have understood all names and forms to be that, your mind will gradually mature, just as the taste improves with the ripening of a fruit, so also you will recognize the waxing of good and the waning of evil in you. As your mind matures, there will come a time when you should meet your master. That is not to say that you go in search of them or they come in search of you. At the right time, the meeting will happen. All are moving in their own ways. Your fitness brings you together, makes you trust, makes them teach you the right way and also makes you follow their instructions. That is the straight way to reach God, which is to gain the fourth state. You will follow the way and reach your goal, which is being consciousness bliss. The way shown by the Master is final, straight, and making for unity. It is well tried, 
natural and free from pain. When you are following the way shown by the Master, doubts will not arise. There will be no fear. Are not fear and doubt the characteristics of the way of darkness? How can they meet you in the way of truth shown by the Master? In this manner, the way will itself speak to you and say that it is the right one. In that way, there will be nothing more for you to do but to meet your master and learn from them. That way will be familiar to you as the master and God have made it so. Before you, they had treaded the way. They have shown you the way and you are following them. To how many will you show the same way? And how many more will follow the same way later? Obviously, fear and doubt have no place in the way of truth. When once you have taken a step forward, you will step back. The Master's help is only for the first step forward. You need not do anything for your Master in order to have the way shown to you. Know them to be the messenger of God, sent down to disclose the way to the fit who have become ripe by their own efforts in either or both the directions mentioned earlier. It is God who sends his godly messenger just when you are ripe. Practice with faith in the period of ignorance is called bhakti. The same with knowledge is called jnana. Of the two divisions of bhakti, the one is devotion to God with name and form, and the other is karma, which is love for all. Of the two divisions of jnana, the practice of the true way shown by the master is called yoga, and the resulting state is called jnana. It is natural for all to believe in something which is not seen and then to find it. Those who do not believe can never find. 
Therefore the believers will gain something sometime or other and the unbelievers never gain anything. You can believe even for the simple reason that faith in God is not harmful. Thereby you can share the good effects. This world is meant only for creating faith in you. This is the purpose of creation. Have faith and you can reach God. Though you may not believe all that is said of God, believe at least there is God. This seed is very potent in its growth. It is so mighty as to negate all else and fill all by itself. It is so almighty that you will not see anything besides God, not even yourself. Truly, God is all. Chapter 4 Peace What is peace? Although the world persists when a person is in deep sleep, do they have any cares concerning it? Their mind is tranquil and refreshed. Should their mind be in the same degree calm and refreshed, even when they are face to face with the world and are active therein, then there is peace.
can the mind remain so even when the world confronts us? It depends upon our estimate of the world. The mind is more excited when one's own property is plundered than when another property is similarly plundered. Of one's own things, the loss of one thing causes greater concern than those of another. Why? Because our estimate of the things is the cause of the degree of the delight or anxiety concerning them. Therefore, should one learn to regard all equally, the mind will be extremely peaceful. Or should all things be considered as our own and highly prized, then too there is no cause for pain. Why? What will a person regret? The mind which knows that universal concern is beyond its capacity must automatically become tranquil. Also when one feels that one has no claim on anything or that everything is perishable the mind will remain cool. Thus there will be lasting peace if one looks on all as of the same value. Peace is dependent upon one's intellectual appraisals. I shall now illustrate this. A man wakes up from a dream. His mind is happy or troubled according to his opinion of the things seen in the dream. But on waking, his mind remains unaffected by all the happenings in the dream. It remains the same. Why? Because only now his mind has learned to value all the matters of the dream equally. He is not sorry for the cessation of the dream. Why? He is convinced that the dream is not everlasting and must end on waking. In the same manner, should a person be convinced that they cannot but wake up sometime from the long dream of this world, their mind will be unchanging. It is the state of freshness. This is the state of peace.
This is not to say that a person's relation with the world will cease. Now, only peace and freshness of the mind are theirs. Their actions cannot but vary according to circumstances. The only change in them after the mind has become peaceful is this. Their mind has known the truth and become unattached. Therefore, it rests in peace. Their actions, though changeful, will always be impartial. But the actions of others are changing and cannot be impartial. Thus, the coolness of the mind produces enormous good not only to themselves, but also to the world at large. Peace shows the way to right conduct. A person walks with a lighted lamp in their hand. Can there be any hostility between the light and the ups and downs on the way? There cannot be. But light and darkness cannot be together. The light chases away darkness. It discloses the ups and downs on the way and makes the person walk carefully, whether they move up, down or sideways. It removes the cause of vain complaints such as, that snag hurt my foot or this hollow made me slip. In the same way, after peace is gained, the state of peace makes the person neither hate nor antagonize the world. Rather, it dispels the darkness which conceals from our view the true nature of the world and its snags. In the absence of the light of peace, which enables people to adjust themselves to varying circumstances, they condemn the world as full of misery as they would complain of the snags on the road. Therefore, a person who has gained the utmost peace after knowing the whole world as a complicated dream should not be considered either unrelated to the world or unconcerned with its activities. They alone stand in effective concord with it. Only they are competent to be a person of action. Thus peace is that which regulates one's duties.
the concern of a person of peace in the actions of the world lies in rectifying them. Should they feel fear before this world, what hope of reformation can there be? Especially from those who esteem it and want to possess it. They are in the grip of selfishness, blind to impartiality. To guide the blind on the way or treat the blindness of the eye, one's eyesight must itself be good. In the same way, it is for those to reform the world who have already discerned their unchanging nature from the changeful nature of the world and become peaceful. Such people cannot help serving the world. Why? Can anyone be so hard-hearted as to not lift up a child when it slips and falls? So also for the wise ones who can rightly appraise the troubles of the world and help the people. Because they have already withdrawn themselves from the mind and body. The sage feels no concern under the strain of service to the world. Just as the life principle does not suffer, even when loaded carts pass over the corpse it has left behind by itself. One will not shrink from work or trouble. Only truly realized peace can bestow such courage and coolness. To all appearances, peace will look poor and quite weak, but in effect it beats all, in tenacity and courage it surpasses all. After all, success depends on these qualities. Even if Mount Meru should topple over, the incident will hardly produce a gentle smile in the person of peace, or it will leave them unmoved. This state is helpful, both for worldly and spiritual matters. True happiness in the world is theirs, and that happiness comes out of release from bondage. Peace means doing good to anyone in any manner.
The obstacles to peace are several. They are meant to prove the person. When they confront us, we should be wide awake and keep the delicate flower of the mind distant from even their shadows. If the flower of the mind be crushed, it will lose its fragrance, freshness and colour. It will be neither useful to you, nor can it be presented to others, nor offered to God. Know that your mind is more delicate than even a blossom. By means of a peaceful mind, all your duties to yourself, to others and to God must be discharged. Let it release the same freshness throughout. All blessings for the mind are contained in peace. Unremittingly, worship the God of yourself with the flower of your mind. Let the children of the mental modes watch this worship. Gradually, they will learn to cast away their childish pranks and desire to delight like yourself as they watch your peace they will themselves recoil from their vagaries continue the worship patiently be not led away by the vagaries of the mind. On the contrary, they should become peaceful by your peace. All must get peace. I shall finish in one word. The essence of all the Vedas is peace.